Well, good morning, and we want to welcome you to our worship on this, our continuing celebration of the season of Epiphany. Once again, still in the green season for a few more weeks. And then guess what? Ash Wednesday, Lent, is coming soon. Oh my, we'll have some information about that. We're going to be participating in a home Bible study. We hope every single member of our church participates in the home Bible study that we are currently in production right now. There will be videos from some of our council members that go along with it on our Facebook page that you'll be able to watch as a part of the Bible study, as well as a uh, weekly study for you, for your spouse, your family. If you're comfortable, if you have other people that are included in that extended family group or friends that are in that extended family group, you're welcome to have them come over. But once again, please understand, we as a congregation are still participating in a uh, a very strict COVID protocol. We are not doing small groups in people's homes because we don't want to put people at risk. But if you're comfortable being around certain people, you would like to invite them for your Bible study, you're welcome to do so. So I'm seeding that thought. Our theme during the season of Lent, are you ready for this? It's going to be entitled, The Emotional Christian. We are in a time of great conflict and great emotion swinging back and forth and You've been there, and so have I, and we're going to talk about what it means to be a Christian and to deal with many of the emotions through which we've been going. What's interesting about it, every single one of the lessons during this season of Lent, Jesus is wrestling with certain emotions that we will be looking at. And so we're going to show how we as Christians are called to deal with the emotions. Emotions, by the way, are just, they just are. They're God's creation. They're gifted to us for a purpose. We do have a choice about how we respond to them. That's what we'll be looking at during the season of Latin. I hope it's a blessing to you. Uh, that's it as far as the announcements go. Please keep your eyes open for uh, an upcoming announcement or two about food needs that we have the congregation. We can still use, uh, if you would like to, to donate $20, $25 gift certificates to Walmart or to uh, Giant Eagle, we'd certainly be grateful for that. Those are really helpful to some of our families that are in a pinch and need some help. Um, we will be coming up again pretty soon, not long down the road if we're getting to Lent. Uh, we'll be coming, looking at Easter pretty soon. We'll start putting information about Easter baskets that we'll be making for some of our families. And Sunday school starting March the 1st. Can you believe that? No, March the 6th. Pardon me, it's the very first Sunday in March. So we will be doing resuming Sunday school the very uh, first and third Sundays. At the start, every first and third Sundays, look for information about that. I'm done talking. We need to get to worship. So let's take this opportunity to, again, announce to God our desperate need for God's intervention in our lives through our confession and forgiveness. Let us all, let us all prepare our hearts. We begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It is through water and the Word and the Holy Spirit that God gives us new life. Let us therefore confess our sin, that we may be renewed in the covenant of holy baptism. Strong and faithful God, we confess that we have not lived as the body of Christ in the world. We have veiled our hearts from your light. We have resisted your call to follow. We have failed to exercise your gift of love. Forgive us for the sake of Christ. Heal us with your abundant grace. And help us walk as children of light. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ came amongst us, proclaimed release to the captives, to let the oppressed go free. Today this promise is fulfilled amongst us. God forgives us all our sins. May the Holy Spirit strengthen you to follow Christ. In newness of life. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together our first hymn, Here I Am to Worship.
Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Our first lesson for today is found in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're running out of the book of 1 Corinthians. But we have hopefully gotten along quite well and learned quite a bit about the early church and the conflict that existed in the early church. And so, hear what Paul has to say. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sin. And those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we have all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is the first fruit of those who have died. Here is the lesson. Our psalm is the very first psalm that we reach responsibly, again, congregation joining on every even frame. 
Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or, or take, take the, the path, path that sinners tread, tread or, or sit in the seat, seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and on his law they meditate day and night. night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which, which yield, yield their, their fruit in its season, and their, and their leaves, leaves do not wither, wither. and all, all they, they do, do they prosper. They prosper. The wicked are not so, but are the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, Therefore the, the wicked, wicked will not stand, stand in the judgment, judgment nor sinners, sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous, but the way the of the wicked, the wicked will perish. perish. sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a multitude of people from all of Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And they had come to hear him, to be healed of their diseases by him. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. Now all of the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed all of them. But then he looked up to his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. Who have received, you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and you will weep. Woe to you when people speak well of you, for that is what the ancestors did with all of the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the lesson that you provided for us today. It sounds pretty harsh. There is good news here, however along with the challenging news, but we pray that you'd use this lesson to grow our hearts and our relationship with you and each other. If we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. I hope you enjoyed the picture, and if you get nothing else out of the lesson, except for that beautiful picture that's behind me today, I'm happy with that. That's all good. But for those who would like a challenge today, I'm inviting you to take out your handout that is again printed or posted on the Facebook pages underneath the announcement for today's lesson. It is entitled, Eternal Versus Temporary Blessings. I don't know if you saw the very opening screen today, if it kind of registered with you. It kind of reminds me of Queen and Freddie Mercury. I want it now. I want it all, right? You remember that song by Freddie Mercury? Well, this is kind of the attitude that Jesus is running into and a lot of the things that he uh, is dealing with. People come to him for blessings, but the blessings they want are often very temporary in nature. Jesus wants to kind of put this in perspective and say that there's something bigger. We're not only here about the temporary blessings. In fact, we shouldn't be here at all. You know, it does concern me. There are a lot of churches. They fixate on temporary physical blessings, none of which are going to be taken with us into the kingdom of heaven. So why do we waste our time on these things? God knows that we need food for the table. God knows that we need a roof over our head. Why do we fixate on these things when we should be focused upon the things that are of eternal value? I think this is kind of error. I did my sermon. I, I could just sit down right now. You know me. I'm not going to do that. I, we're going to go through this lesson a little bit. For here we are in a lesson today where the crowd finally are recognizing Jesus, they're coming to Jesus for healing. 
But again, as I mentioned to you, they are tending to focus on the materialistic needs. But Jesus, what he does, he understands the need of somebody who's hurting physically. Or somebody whose belly is hungry. Sometimes we first must address their gnawing need, the belly that's, that's gurgling or the body that's broken, first need to be tended to. Yes, they're materialistic in nature. But Jesus, as I mentioned to you, is not unconcerned about these things. So he healed these folks. He fed these folks first before he preached to them. Kind of a good lesson for the church. Sometimes we want to pat people on the head and send them away hungry. If they are truly hungry, we need to feed them. Because often people cannot hear the word until one's materialistic needs and physical needs are taken care of. Physical needs, as I mentioned to you, they're only temporary. But what Jesus really wants to get to is our spiritual poverty, the lack of our relationship with God, and what we truly need. So he goes to the Beatitudes. We have Jesus speaking to his disciples. Now there's a great crowd around him, but he looks straight to his disciples. He wants to educate them about what they've just seen. Remember how he's just fed them. He's just healed these people that come around Jesus. And he wants them to know that these people are blessed. So he says the very first thing, blessed are the poor. I caution you. I guarantee you, if you're like most people, you hear in spirit. This is Luke we're talking about. Luke was not talking about the poor in spirit. He understood that there is a poverty that many people carry with them in this life, but that did not alienate them from God. See, so much of Jewish theology was built into this idea, name it, claim it, prosperity gospel that we seem to have today that infects a lot of our churches in the United States of America. This prosperity gospel is so contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they had this idea that if you're rich, you're wealthy. It's a sign of God's blessing. Boulder dash. Luke looks around at all of these people and heard Jesus say, Blessed are the poor. Not poor in spirit. Blessed are the physically poor people who've got nothing to their names, who don't even know how they're going to put food on the table today. How can you say that? That is really a dumb thing to say, doesn't it? Except Jesus said it. So you can argue with him. But let's kind of get through this. Blessed are the poor. As I said, this is said directly to the disciples because the disciples remember how in our last week's lesson they left everything at the shore of Galilee to follow Jesus. They've got nothing. Who are the blessed people? The disciples who have left everything, all materialistic blessings behind to follow Jesus. See, I'm afraid for some of our pastors... In these materialistic churches, the name and claim it churches, the prosperity gospel churches, they haven't left behind materialism. They're so fixated on these things. I don't know where they see this in Jesus. It is so contrary to the gospel. The disciples of Jesus leave that behind to follow him. So why are they blessed? Because they depend upon the sufficiency of God to provide for them. Now I want you to be clear about this. It's not that Jesus blesses poverty. It reminds me of uh, Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof. He says, uh, it's a prayer to God, and he says, Oh Lord, I know that you love the poor because you made so many of them. Right? No, society makes the poor. There's ample food. For every man, woman, and child to eat three square meals a day and have sufficient amount to live and have a prosperous life, but it is greed that keeps it from them. Human greed, by the way. So Jesus isn't blessing poverty. But what he's trying to communicate to them is that the disciples are blessed because they have rejected the world's values. That's what's so blessed about being poverty in poverty. Not because you're poor, but because we've chosen something better than materialistic blessings. Theirs, Jesus says, is the kingdom of heaven. The people who've chosen not financial materialistic blessings, 
but have chosen to follow Jesus. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They get it. The domain of God is at their complete disposal. There is a present reality to this. Now, you still may be poor, but the kingdom is fulfilled through Christ's presence in your life. So no matter how poor you are, God is with you. Remember, remember remind me of uh, uh, one of our members who went to Trinidad and said, oh my goodness, the people are so materialistically poor and yet so spiritually rich compared to the people of our country. Because every single day they had a smile. They didn't know where their food was coming from for that day. They had a smile on their face because they believed and trusted that God would provide. Well, I don't have that type of faith. They are better Christians than we are. They understand that it doesn't matter how poor they are. They understood how, understand how blessed they are. It goes on, blessed are the hungry and those that weep. <laughs> Those with an immediate need will find their fullness in Christ. You have all been there where you're weeping and hungry and yearning for something more. And Christ promises to fulfill that need. Weeping is related to those who grieve because evil, because the evil that's entered into this world and the world's rebellion. So remember, Jesus is again talking to his disciples in this lesson, not the people out there who came to be healed by Jesus, but the disciples. He wants them to put into perspective what he is trying to accomplish here. If you look at the world and you weep because of how broken it is, you have the heart of a disciple. Now, I want to caution you because I know a lot of Christians who, they don't weep. They go there and say, oh, it's a shame what's happened in this world. Tisk, tisk, tisk. All these sinners, God's going to get them and they're going to hell. You know, and I see that attitude in the church. There's no compassion. When Jesus sees the brokenness of the world, he cries, he weeps. Remember as he looks over Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, you who, who kill the prophets. God would take them up like a mother hen would gather them in, into, her, into her breasts, but they would not have any of that. Jesus looks at the world with great compassion. So if you're looking at the world and you see, yes, it's broken, God just wants to love it. You've got the spirit of a disciple. If you look at the world and say, oh, the world is broken, shame on them, they'll get theirs. That is not the spirit of the disciple. Blessed are the hungry and those who weep because they are the, of the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are hated. Jesus says, those who suffer on account of following Christ, they're not to be pitied. Why? Because they found something better than human adoration. We find peace because in Christ because we have something bigger and better to live for than the adulation of this world. Despite the fact that this world is in a state of great conflict, we can be at peace. Because we know where our bread is buttered, right? Jesus concludes this lesson with woes. So we have the blessings, but then the woes. But I want you to be careful about these woes. Once again, it's not, tisk, tisk, tisk. It's not the attitude that Jesus has. You people who don't love me the way these disciples do. That is not Jesus' attitude here. Okay? Let me educate you. Each woe, first of all, correlates to one of the blessings, one of the beatitudes, the blessings that, that Jesus just gave. So there's a correlation between that, a, a parallelism. This is a very Jewish thing, okay? It's the same thing, I love to go into it, don't have the time. If you look at the six days of creation in Genesis 1, the first three days and the first four days correlate. The fourth day goes with the first day. The fifth day goes with the uh, second day. The sixth day goes with the third day. Look at, look at it. Go read it. It's a, it's a poetic parallelism. The same thing is happening here with Jesus. There's a parallelism to this. These blessings, there's an, there's an equal and opposite woe. Okay? So what Jesus is doing by giving these woes is he's defying the values of the world. 
Woe is not a condemnation. It's like, whoa, okay? Whoa, take it easy, baby. It's not a condemnation. It's not you, whoa, you. Okay, it's, it's an expression of remorse. Oh, don't you get it? I want you to be a part of this. This, again, is the spirit that Jesus is trying to give to his disciples. So don't hear, whoa, condemnation, when you hear, whoa, oh, there's something better for you. It's a sorrowful, it's a sigh. Woe is a... We need to look at this world with great compassion. Those who seek the world's values do not depend upon God and they miss out on the blessedness of being an inheritor of the kingdom of God. We just want you to be a part. So Jesus is expressing his remorse to the rich. I'm so sorry that you're rich. Because you're blinded by being rich. All you name it, claim it pastors. All you people who are attending these churches where you believe that you're going to get your blessing, your materialistic blessing, and God wants you to be a millionaire. Well, you know, their whole thing is a scam. It's a scheme. It's like a pyramid scam. In a lot of these churches, basically. Come on, man. You're blinded by wealth. Wealth gives a person an illusion that we can be self-reliant. I don't need God anymore, right? The rich, Jesus says, hey, you've been paid in full. You're going to miss out on the greater blessing because you're blinded to what God really wants to do. There's no other blessing in the world for a person who's rich who thinks that's it. There's only money. And you know what? You can't take money with you beyond the grave. That's a sad way to live. Some of the most unhappy people, this is actually true. There's a movie that came out probably about 10 years ago, a documentary called, I think it was Happiness. And I've mentioned this years ago. It really made an impression on me. They were actually studying the happiest places in the world. And what they found out is, you know, there's certainly a, a monetary level where people can achieve that that it frees them to have a, a happy lifestyle. But they found the most unhappy people in the world were in European countries, in the United States of America, these first world countries where there's a great deal of wealth. We don't appreciate what we have. Wealth blinds us to the important things. They found some of the happiest people in life were in Calcutta. You know where Calcutta is, right in India, where Mother Teresa was where the poor are dying on the streets every day. Why? Because they're surrounded by people they loved. And that was all that was important to them. So the rich, they're so fixated on their wealth, they miss out on the true blessings of life. Wealth does not make people happy. He says, woe to the rich. <sighs> What's his next one? Woe to those who are full and laugh now. <sighs> you don't seem to lack for anything. You know, sometimes it's the people who seem to have their life all together that are some of the least content. Movie stars or wealthy, whatever. They laugh and they go to parties, but, you know, once the parties are over, their lives are pretty empty. Their laughter is superficial. It's only temporary. <sighs> Woe, the third one, to those of whom others speak well of. I mean, sounds like, you know, I, I don't know if your mom was, you know, like my grandmother. You know, you don't want to bring bad news to their name. You got don't dishonor the name of the family, right? You want people to speak well of you. Well... Who cares whether people speak well of you as long as God speaks well of you? It doesn't matter. One often must sacrifice one's own principles if you're to be highly praised by other people. If you've got to sacrifice your principles in order to be highly praised, it isn't worth it. Follow of Christ, 
They value the kingdom priorities over praise itself. <laughs> so if we are to look at what the epiphany is here today, I think the epiphany is this. Jesus, Jesus is actually making a mockery of the world's values. I think the Christian church in the United States of America has gotten way too cozy with the values of this world. We need to be a little less comfortable with the values of this world, with wealth and prosperity. It's even, like I said, infected our churches. We seek temporary gain, material blessing that will never lead to a fulfilling life. There's nothing wrong with having enough money to put food on the table and to go on vacation. Those things are fine. But we need to be somewhat at ease. Uh, at not, we need to no longer be so easy with or comfortable with the values of this world that seems to value these things above all. Everybody wants to be famous, right? I'm going to go American Idol. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to be famous. I want to be an athlete. I'm going to be famous. And most of them aren't. And so they live a miserable life, always trying to pursue something they will never achieve. And people who do achieve that stardom find it's not all it's cracked up to be. It's an illusion. It's a sad way to live your life. But here's the good news. Those who depend upon God have access to the riches of the kingdom of heaven right now because Jesus Christ is in our lives. That's all I know. Life is hard. There are oftentimes difficult things all around you. But the one who puts their trust in Christ, even amidst the chaos of this world, can have peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessings of this lesson today that we've received. It's a hard lesson. I mean, I'd, honestly, I'd like to have a lot of money and just escape. And go where it's comfortable. But you've called us to be engaged in this world, in this life, and to have a perspective that transcends the boundaries of this materialistic world and our materialistic existence. Let us understand that we are so rich today because of your presence in our lives, and we give thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing together our hymn of the day.
fantastic. God's power does make us strong. And so we confess today the faith that unites us and gives us peace in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do give you thanks that we have the privilege to come to you in prayer and all things. We know that you do care about the materialistic needs of our lives. You do care when we are hungry, when we're struggling, when our bodies are broken. But you also want us to realize that there's more to life than this. For all of these blessings that we receive, the temporary blessings, will one day be gone. The toys that we got for Christmas, many of them are broken in the garbage already. We've already used those gift cards on Starbucks. It's, they're, they're gone. But you know, the blessing of a relationship with you is something that lasts into eternity. So God, let us put away these childish, foolish, materialistic concerns. Trust them to your care and keeping and turn our attention to what truly is important. We do pray for this world, God. We are struggling. We're struggling in the most important things. I'm not talking about COVID, and I'm not talking about other illnesses. I'm talking about our relationships with each other. We become intolerant of people who disagree. And God, this spirit cannot and is not compatible with the life of one who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ. Let us be kind and compassionate loving and caring because we have been cared for by the Almighty God. We do lift up those who are on our hearts today. There are many. We've heard of many who are struggling with COVID right now. We've heard of many, God, who've lost loved ones. We think of uh, a young 21-year-old whose funeral I will be doing shortly who was killed in a car accident. His grandparents are distraught. We just pray your comfort to be upon them. We just pray that you be with his entire family. Lord, whatever else is on our hearts and minds, we do know that you will hear these prayers. We ask you to be kind and gracious to those who ask. In your hands, O oh Lord, we now commend all of those concerns that we've named before you today. We trust in your mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We close our service today singing just a fantastic gospel song and uh, from Americana. and Just a beautiful hymn of faith. Let us sing this song and leave with this song in our hearts today.
Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.